Welcome to the Clarence Church of Christ. Glad you're here. Glad you're here to praise the Lord and honor Him on this day. It's a beautiful day, and I would just ask that you all stand, and we'll turn to page 313. My hope is built on nothing less. 313. We'll be singing all four verses. Welcome to the Clarence Church of Christ. My name is Mitch Knight. I'm one of the ministers here. So glad that you're here to worship with us. Just as a reminder, on the outside and on the inside of each row are some uh, prayer request cards that you can submit. Uh, if you would like us to intercede for you on behalf of the Lord, we can do that and we're happy to do that. Please also, if you haven't, grab your communion elements for when we celebrate the Lord's Supper later on in the service. Uh, this morning I'd like to start in God's Word, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 24. Through 27. <clears throat> a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? the one who is at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Please stand and continue in worship with us. Thank you. Please turn to 372. Have thine own way, Lord. 372. Why I am one. 
Oh, uh, if there are any kids in here who would like to come up front and sing, if you know the song Lighthouse, you can come up and play an instrument and sing on the steps up here, if you want. guys don't know is how good it smells up here right now with all this food. <clears throat> um, sorry to concentrate.
once again. So as a disclaimer, none of what I'm about to say is a political statement. It's all to serve a theological point. I assume most of us have heard the news about what transpired yesterday that there was an attempt on the former president's life uh, at a rally. And while we can be grateful that he ended up surviving that attempt, Unfortunately, an innocent bystander was shot and killed, and someone ended up in critical condition. Now, I'm not here to give you hope in our country. I'm here to give you hope in God's kingdom. And we, as Christians, have a resurrection hope. What has transpired is not ideal in God's way. The fact that anyone would want to shoot and kill anybody else is not the way that God intended for us to live our human lives. And so that is lamentable. But we have a hope and a future. We know that in our resurrection life, love will be the rule, not the exception. People will not seek to kill their opponents. They will seek to love them. And this day, I just want you to be encouraged by that fact, that no matter how crazy things get, no matter how dark things seem, there's always going to be the light of God's kingdom that will shine through. And so this day, we lament the fact that an event like this even transpired in the first place. That's terrible. But we also have a future to look forward to where there is nothing like this that will ever happen again, thanks to our King and Lord Jesus Christ. And I would like to pray to him right now. Father in heaven, we thank you that even in the midst of darkness you are in control. Uh, we know the horrible things that have transpired yesterday in terms of um, the attempt on former President Trump's life. Um, the fact that anyone would want to kill anybody else is clearly uh, an indicator that this world has fallen, um, that we are not living life the way that we should be. It's lamentable that we're even up here talking about this, that we're praying about this. Um, and while we're grateful that he was not hurt, regardless of what we feel about him, whether we like him or don't like him, we certainly don't wish ill will on him. We lament the fact that an innocent person has been shot and killed, and the fact that an innocent person is in critical condition. And we pray that you would give peace um, and hope to those families that are suffering because of this. But Father, most of all, we have a hope that is not rooted in the state of our country. Now, we are blessed to live here. We are blessed to have freedoms. But most of all, we are blessed with the freedom of Christ that you bought for us on the cross. And we thank you that he is our Lord and our King, even in times where things are dark and trying. And so this morning, we surrender our wills over to you, the one who can sort these things out, um, who can achieve justice, and who can restore hope from ashes. We thank you most of all that because of Jesus and his resurrection, that we look forward to a world where people are not going to be killing each other, where people are not going to be violent, and where people are going to love each other as the rule and not the exception. And although yesterday and today is a sad day as we remember what has happened and the lives uh, that were lost and um, the lives that were damaged because of this, we know that you work out all things for your good and glorious purposes. And so we submit everything that we're struggling with today to you. You are in control and you are our Lord. And we thank you for that and the resurrection hope that we have. I pray all this to you, Father, in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, which you have given us. Amen. Would you stand and sing another song with us? One of our, the themes for today is humility. And it turns out it's hard to find a song about humility. 
kind of makes sense. Um, but this felt fitting because I think when we focus on who God is and how great he is, it puts our, our own selves in perspective. So.
I'm keeping you guessing every week, aren't I? This morning we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you have a Bible with you or um, a Bible app on your phone, I encourage you to follow along with me here this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to start in the second verse. First Corinthians is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and he continues his letter to them, answering questions that they sent to him, asking his opinion, his direction on a variety of topics. And he continues in chapter 11, verse 2, by saying this, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every woman is Christ, and the head of every woman is man. The head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but women, but woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her he own head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the, Lord, women, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman." For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves, is it proper for women to pray to God and her head with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man is, has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For the long hair is giving, given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice nor do the churches of God. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your, meeting, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have, been, there, there have to be differences among you to show which of you has God's approval. So then, when you come together, is it not the Lord's Supper you eat? For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why, why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are be being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should, not, should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. Would you join me in prayer as we continue? Father God, this morning we ask that as we reflect on this text that they wouldn't just be words that we read from many years ago, that it wouldn't just be history, but that the power 
of your word, your living and active word, would be present in our life today. We ask that you would translate these words to the details of our life, that we can see where they're leading us to the abundant life you want us to experience in your son, Jesus. Father, shape and mold us toward that direction. It's by the power of your spirit through your son, Jesus, that we pray this. Amen. When I was younger, my mom's side of the family would get together a week or so before Christmas, and adults would sit at the big formal dinner table, and usually the kids had to sit at a card table in another room. One food that usually made an appearance at this family get-together was my great aunt's cookies. One year at this get-together, I really liked these cookies, and I had already had some earlier in the day during the meal, but people had munched on stuff kind of throughout the day. And I wanted to have some extras after the get-together, and I didn't want anyone else to eat the rest of them, so before anyone else ate the rest of them, I took a few of them, and I stashed them in my shoes, where I figured no one would see them or take them, so I stashed them there for me so that others couldn't enjoy them. My family still reminds me of this incident today. Like if we have a get together and there's cookies there, it's, do you want some extra cookies to put into your shoes before you, before you leave for later? And so, ha ha ha, yeah, I know I did that, that kind of thing. But our lives are filled with comparisons of the haves and the have-nots. The haves and the have-nots. A lot of our current political cycle is focusing on the haves and the have-nots. A lot of life is comparing that what someone has that maybe you don't have. A lot of our angst on a day-to-day -day basis is about having or not having enough for basic needs. Or being able to do this or that. Our lives are also filled with temptations to do things that benefit ourself at the exclusion of others. Temptations for men to, to use force and dominance to maintain positions of authority. Temptations to dress however we want, even if it's tempting or uncomfortable for another. Temptations for men to act like women and women to act like men. Temptations for any person to create their own sense of morality. Our lives are filled with influences that shape us to believe that selfishness is the way to abundant life. That focusing on ourself at the exclusion of others is what will give us access to life. What will give us the freedom, the authority, the equality, or the good life that we desire. We're shaped into selfishness. We're shaped to exclude others. We're shaped to prioritize ourselves over others. In our world today, where are we shaped into service to others? Where are we shaped from selfishness into service to others? Where is selfishness shaped into service? Where is selfishness shaped into service? Where would we go to be shaped into that kind of way of life? The good news of 1 Corinthians 11 is that we have been given access to where we can be shaped from selfishness into service of others. The Apostle Paul writes to the followers of Jesus in Corinth to highlight that Jesus and his way of life models the abundant life that we desire. Paul highlights that Jesus found abundant life as a blessing of being in relationship with his heavenly father. Jesus was given authority by his heavenly father. Jesus was given freedom from anxiety and worry of fitting in from being in relationship with his heavenly father. Jesus was given equality with God and humanity in relationship with his heavenly father. Jesus was given a good life from the one who is life and created life by being in relationship with his heavenly father. And because Jesus found himself cared for in relationship with his heavenly father, he was freed from caring for himself to care for others. 
Jesus' relationship with his heavenly father shaped him away from selfishness into service to others. Jesus' relationship with his heavenly father is what shaped him to give up his life in death for those who were unlike him. Where is selfishness shaped into service? Where is selfishness shaped into service? It's shaped by being in relationship with God, by being united to the life of Jesus, by focusing our life on Jesus and following his example. Where is selfishness shaped into service? When we're with Jesus. When we're focused on his life and teachings. When we're focused on his death and resurrection that makes all wrongs right. If you've ever been to some of the fancier steakhouses in our area, you know that you just can't show up in shorts and a t-shirt. One place in particular requires you to wear formal attire to eat there. While some might bristle at this standard saying, I should have the freedom to dress how I want. We Americans don't like to be told what to do. We like being our own authority. And the people of first century Corinth were similar. In 1 Corinthians 11, we encounter a situation where women were participating in the worship gathering of other Jesus followers with their head uncovered. The context of the passage indicates that women having their heads covered during worship, especially when they were praying or prophesying, that was the conventional standard of the day, that if they were to be doing that, their head would be covered. And some women were leaving their head uncovered, flaunting their freedom to do so. Well, that might be the standard in Corinth, but I'm going to do what I want to do when we gather to worship Jesus. Now, there are a few concepts that need to be explained here. Because you, you might be like, head coverings, what's this all about? That sounds just old and antiquated, and what's it got to do with today? In first century Corinth, the phrasing for an uncovered or covered head could be referenced by a couple different things. One, it could be a reference to an actual head covering, like some kind of uh, shawl that, that goes over a woman's head or just some kind of covering. If you ever see a picture of, of uh, Jesus' mother Mary, often you see a picture of that, something like that on, on her head. It's just a piece of cloth that would actually be worn over the hair of a woman. But another way that this reference could be used is that it could be not a reference to a piece of cloth that covers a woman's head, but rather talking about the state of a woman's hair in general, whether a woman's hair is pinned up or tied back or whether it is hanging down. In my opinion, this second option seems to make the most sense, especially in relation to the other language that Paul uses in this section, especially when he references a woman cutting off or shaving her head. Why would you talk about cutting off or shaving your head if it's just put the covering on? Like, he's talking about the hair is what it seems that he's talking about to me. Beyond whether this was a cloth head covering or a head covering with pinned up hair, the way a woman styled her hair conveyed something more specific in first century Corinth. It was something more than just a preference of hairstyle. Like, oh, I like mine down or I like mine up. That, that wasn't really the issue. In first century Corinth, women with their hair down in public was an indicator of being possibly a morally loose person. Temple prostitutes did this, or prostitutes in general who were trying to solicit men for sexual encounters. If you wanted to know which woman was available, look for how her hair was. Was it up or was it down? Also, in first century Corinth, women wore their hair up as a social indicator of embodying the female sex. It was a way of differentiating women from men in society. A woman who wore her hair up was also a way of indicating her relationship status. Similar to how women and men wear wedding rings in our culture. When you want to know if someone's married, you look at their hand, their, their left hand and see if there's a ring there. Similar in first century Corinth, you would look at the woman and say, well, is her hair up or down? And that would be an indicator of her relationship status. Overall, women wearing their hair up in public was a social standard in first century Corinth. To not do so was considered odd, inappropriate, disorderly, or confusing. 
Throughout 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 through 16, Paul addresses a scenario in the Corinthian church where women were apparently claiming that they have the freedom or right to act as they want. That their faith in Jesus somehow freed them from the social norms of Corinth. That they could wear their hair down in worship. That they could make their self-interest the focus. While women covering their head was a standard in first century Corinth, that isn't a social norm for us in the 21st century, especially in America today. To see how this applies to us today, we have to look past the form to the principle behind the form. Paul is ultimately calling the women of the Corinthian church to act in a way that isn't shameful to the name of Jesus. To act in a way that considers others. For women to wear their hair down in worship in Corinth could taint the witness of the church. It could also convey to the watching world that the church of Jesus is no different than the other temples in Corinth. They have prostitutes, and apparently the church of Jesus does too. By the way, women appear in worship with their hair down. It could convey to the watching world that a woman's faithfulness to her husband wasn't important. Look, she's putting herself out there for other men with her hair down. This would cause disgrace to her husband and to the marriage. But again, this was the form of the principle for first century Corinth. What might this principle that Paul is highlighting look like in our 21st century American context? It might look like dressing centrally with other believers. Or giving the appearance of attracting someone who's not your spouse. Or not wearing a wedding ring. Or spending a lot of time with someone of the opposite sex who's not your husband. Or making loyalty questioning comments about someone of the opposite sex. Like a wife saying to another guy, he looks very attractive. Or a guy saying to another girl who's not his wife, of, she's hot. Something along those lines could be an equivalent of what that would look like today. The form is different, but the principle is the same. Not giving the appearance of inappropriateness, sensuality, or infidelity. Not looking to your benefit, but to the benefit of others. Looking out to honor and be faithful to one's spouse. Looking out for faithful witness to honor and be faithful to what Jesus has called you to in marriage. Inappropriateness in relationship to those you're not married to. Considering others more than maybe what you're tempted to put, make about yourself. Henry Ford brought the assembly line process to the forefront of our society. In an assembly line, multiple people work simultaneously, but on different parts of whatever they're putting together. On an assembly line, who is most important? In a sense, every person is equally important. But each person is also interdependent on the person before them and after them to make the assembled part work together to fashion a car or computer or toy or whatever it is that's getting put together. Each person on the line is equal. They're all human beings that are working on the line. There's equality there, but each person's function on the line is different. They're dependent on each other or subordinate, if you want to look at it that way, to the other people on the line. Without the others, the product doesn't come together. Each person's role is needed, even though someone's role has to come before another. Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 through 16, point toward this order that God has fashioned into his human creation. Paul points back to Genesis 1 and 2 to make this point. Adam and Eve are both created human, but without each other there is no male or female, Without each other, there is no pro procreation, meaning none of us are probably here. Each are equal in their humanity, but each are different in their functionality. Adam and masculinity as a whole contribute certain qualities different from women. And Eve and feminin femininity as a whole contribute certain qualities different from men. But each contributes something to the whole of humanity. And back to 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is connecting that the most abundant life possible is to live into the way God created you, male or female, man 
or woman. To confuse this order is to miss the abundant life that God has for you. Paul is reminding these women in 1 Corinthians to live into the abundant life that God has created them to embody. And to also live into the abundant life that God has for them in a relationship with their husband. And to also live into the abundant life that God has for them in a relationship with the other men in the body of Christ. Essentially, Paul is highlighting that focus on ourselves is not what's going to lead to the abundant life that we desire. Rather, focusing on how we can use the body that God's given us or our gender or the natural gifts and abilities that God has given us to consider and honor and serve others, that's what will lead to a community of people where everybody is interdependent on each other. Where is selfishness, selfishness shaped into service? Where is selfishness shaped into service? As we'll reflect further, we'll see that we're shaped to view life this way by focusing on Jesus and his other-oriented way of life. Where I grew up, there was a restaurant that is like one of the fancier restaurants in, in the town where I grew up near. And it's one of the places that kids often weren't allowed to go to. In fact, my parents even said when I was growing up, they're like, they were going to dinner there and they'd be like, well, kids aren't allowed to go. And I'd be like, what do you mean a kid's not allowed to go? Like, I'm allowed to go to every other restaurant, but this one magical restaurant I'm not allowed to go to, apparently. So it always baffled me that, like, adults were allowed to go there, but I, as a kid, was not allowed to go there. And really, it's just that they didn't want loud and immature kids to make the environment odd and goofy there. And so I understand now, like, why that was a thing. But as a kid, I was just like, why are they allowed to go and I'm not? Like, you're included, I'm excluded. But even though I wasn't allowed to eat in the restaurant, often my parents and grandparents always brought, some home, brought home some extra garlic bread that this restaurant was known for, and I was able to have some. The haves, my parents and grandparents, took their experience at the restaurant and shared it with me, the have-not. In 1 Corinthians 11, 17-34, Paul is advocating for the church in Corinth to embody this posture of service to the poor and excluded. This section is a glimpse of what communion, or the Lord's Supper, looked like in the first century. It contained the bread and cup that we use each Sunday here, that you likely grabbed on your way in here. But this wasn't just that micro like meal that we usually partake of. It was actually a full meal. It looked more like this in the first century. It took place during an actual meal, not just some food that you ate during some other religious practice. While we become accustomed to gathering for worship in a designated church building, there was, this was not the case for the church in the first century, especially in first century Corinth. Following and worshiping Jesus was still an up-and-coming practice. It didn't have the established order and practices that we're accustomed to now, including access and means to have a separate building like we're in today where they could gather for worship. What was more typical was that the church gathered in someone's home. And likely it was the home, a large home, that could accommodate a lot of people. And the size of home that, that was that big was likely the home of a wealthier person in the church. When the church met for worship, it would also meet around a meal. And part of the meal was breaking bread and drinking wine or grape juice of some kind in remembrance of Jesus' broken body and shed blood on the cross. The origin of communion or the Lord's Supper that Jesus instituted also took place during a meal. If you know your, your Bible in any sense and, and know the life of Jesus, you, you might recall this, that the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples before he died took place at a meal. It wasn't just like they had juice and bread. That wasn't all they partook of. It was an entire meal. And that Passover meal was a meal that the Israelites celebrated in remembrance of God's deliverance of them out of slavery in Egypt. As Christianity spread beyond Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth, the meal dynamic of communion faded into the background, 
But partaking of the bread and the cup remained forefront to remember Jesus and his way of life as the standard for living and worship. A dynamic of first century Corinthian culture that isn't apparent to us while reading the passage that we looked at earlier is that wealthy people were known for hosting parties. And part of hosting parties to invite those less well off to eat. So the wealthy person was hosting a party and they would invite, invite less well off people to join them. But they would serve inferior food and drink to those who were the guests. So instead of this spread that's up here, it would be something like a peanut butter jelly sandwich instead. The nice food with the wealthy people and the not as nice food down with the poor people. While the wealthy people are eating select, expensive, fine food in the formal dining area of the house, the poor people were in an entirely other room eating less quality food. And what ensued is what we encounter in 1 Corinthians 11 that Paul highlights. In verse 18 of chapter 11, he talks about there being divisions among the church. Well, I wonder why when you have some people eating this and other people eating that in a different room. Very divisive. Verse 21 talks about private dinners. I have my food, you have this food. Or verse 22 that talks about the wealthy eating to the point where they're overfed and drunk and the poor people don't have anything or barely have anything. And the guests are hungry and sober to their poor status that still exists. This was the temptation for the wealthy Corinthians during this time to do what Corinthians normally did and treat other people the way Corinthians normally did. Paul is not saying it's unrealistic for there to be people of different status levels coming together to eat. In verse 19, he references this. Like, poor and wealthy people coming together, that's not really odd. That's actually a good thing. For the bringing together of poor and wealthy is what the kingdom of God is all about. Forging into one community those who are unlikely to come together if it wasn't for following Jesus. Paul, in a sense, is commending this aspect, but he is correcting the divisive manner in which they are gathering for worship. When the wealthy focus on themselves and look past the need of the poor in their community, they are despising God's church and humiliating their poor brothers and sisters in Christ. The wealthy followers of Jesus in Corinth were continuing to allow themselves to be shaped by the values of Corinth rather than the values of of Jesus. Where is the selfishness of these wealthy followers of Jesus shaped into service of their poor brothers and sisters in Christ? It's in the very meal that they gather to remember Jesus. In Jesus. It's in Jesus' life and example where they're shaped from selfishness into service. Paul points to the example Jesus set with his own life. Paul points to Jesus' example of giving up focus on himself for service to others. Paul points to Jesus' example of giving up his life on the cross to overcome death on our behalf, going from wealth to poverty. Paul points to Jesus' relationship with his Heavenly Father as what shaped Jesus away from the temptation to be selfish and fight, being, but instead to be handed over his life in death so that he could serve and give humanity a future beyond death in his resurrection. Jesus' relationship with his heavenly Father shaped him away from selfishness and into service to us. Paul points back to Jesus in the meal that remembers his selfless, servant-hearted life, reminding the church in Corinth that this is the way of life Jesus is trying to shape you and me into. Not the division that the world shapes us into, not the selfishness that the world shapes us into, 
which is leading us toward a life that's just about ourselves and ultimately us separated from others and, and destitution for us and others. Whereas Jesus is trying to lead you and me to abundant life, to the abundant life that he has blessed us with and the abundant life that he wants to give to others. When Paul directs these followers of Jesus to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup, he is not talking about a private you and God moment there. Because that's not what was happening in this context. There weren't just people eating their own little meal. Actually, that's what they were tempted to do. I'm going to eat my private meal while the other people are over there. And we still fall prey to the same thing. I'm going to have my private me and God moment and not think about the other people in my life or the people in my community, or how my life inter interacts with them. What Paul has in mind is a real discernment of how our selfishness and our lack of awareness and consideration of the poverty of our brothers and sisters in Christ is impacting the health of the church, the witness of the church, and the real withholding of resources that, that we might be able to provide to our needy, brothers and sisters. Is our faith in Jesus just a me and Jesus thing and, and I could actually do it without any of the rest of you in here? Or is my faith in Jesus interdependent on the rest of you who are gathered here? That's the question we're faced with. Communion is a moment to discern if you're being shaped into the way of Jesus and how he treats others. It's only in Jesus' selfless example that the Corinthian church was going to be shaped from selfishness into service to others. And how they dressed or acted toward the opposite gender, what we see in verses 2 through 16. Or how they treated their poor brothers and sisters, what we see in verses 17 through 34. The same is true for us today as well. All of this wonderful food was made by my wife, FYI, so she's the one that should be credited with it. Following Jesus is where selfishness, selfishness is shaped into service. Where is selfishness shaped into service? In following Jesus' example. Today, we don't deal with women's hair being down as something that's inappropriate, nor do we deal with wild, divisive meals during our worship gatherings. But are there ways that we're still, still tempted to be like the first century Corinthian followers of Jesus? Are we sensual in how we dress among the body of Christ? Are we shaming our spouse by how we dress or speak about them or speak about others? In the body of Christ, are relationships and marriages different from the rest of the world? In the body of Christ, are we presenting a different standard in our relationship to each other? A standard that looks obviously different to the rest of the world. In the body of Christ, are we giving up our selfishness to focus on serving and lifting up the skills and abilities of others who are not like us. From time to time, people get or call or get a hold of the ministers or elders here asking for financial help. And thankfully for some years, there has been something called the Benevolence Fund that's been in place. The Benevolence Fund is something I'm always learning a little bit more about because it started before my time here. But my understanding is that a group of people in this congregation made a commitment to regularly give a set amount toward uh, this benevolence fund over and above their regular giving to the general needs of the church and over and above their mi giving to our mission partners. As people gave to this fund, it has enabled the leadership of the church to financially assist many needy, needy people over the years. Sometimes it's people connected to the church who are going through a rough situation and sometimes it's people not connected to the church at all. But people who are at the end of their rope and just look and are just looking for some assistance to get them by. The 
This benevolence fund is possible because people in this congregation have been shaped by the selflessness and sacrificial and servant-hearted and compassionate example of Jesus to us and to others who they've never met. Jesus shaped the initial group of people to band together, to give of their means, to be shaped away from their selfishness, to serve and bless others in need. The benevolence of this church is a result of giving and over and beyond general giving and giving to mission partners. Benevolence isn't a line item in our church budget. It's a result of intentional selfless service and giving to others. Because Jesus was intentional and selfless in his service to us on the cross to overcome death. So this group of people and us too can be shaped to be that kind of people. Are you being shaped by Jesus in that way? Where is your selfishness being shaped into service? Where is your selfishness being shaped into service? It happens by following Jesus, following his example, his standard, the standard he set for us in the meal that he gave us to remember his sacrificial and selfless and serving way of life. Today, what is shaping you away from God's abundant life? What is shaping you away from service to others and instead shaping you toward anxiety and worry and focus on yourself? 1 Corinthians 11 invites you to consider how Jesus will shape you toward a more abundant life. Please find me or another trusted follower of Jesus to help you discern what your next step of faith in experiencing the abundant life in Jesus could be. Ultimately, we hope you will unite your life to Jesus under the water of baptism and allow him to shape you into his abundant life. Where you get abundant life from him and then that can overflow and serve and bless others. If you've already united your life to Jesus, are you allowing the example and teachings of Jesus to shape you away from selfishness and, and into service to God and others? Are you approaching communion as a private moment? or as a reminder to be less of you and serve and bless others in the body of Christ the way Jesus did for you? How aware are you of others in the body of Christ? Tangible needs like money or a job or intangible needs like loneliness or depression are all things that we all struggle with. How aware are you of those needs in our congregation? How is God's Spirit shaping you away from selfishness and towards service and hospitality to others in the body of Christ? How is Jesus shaping you to serve and host others in the body of Christ? with the resources God's blessed you with. You may notice there's some paper plates on the seats around you. I want to encourage you to grab one of those or find one in a seat near you. And there should be some pencils or pens in the seat backs in front of you. If you could grab one of those, I want to encourage you to go through this exercise here. I want you to think about someone in this room or this congregation, or maybe it's someone in your life you don't know very well. Write their name down on the plate. Or after service, if you don't know them, go introduce yourself and get to know their name. And ask if you can have them over for dinner or go grab dinner or lunch or breakfast or coffee sometime soon. Ideally this week. Or get something on the books on your calendar to invite that person into your life to get to know what's going on in their life. 
This is one practical way we can apply this, where we get to take the table that Jesus has presented to us, that we remember that meal each Sunday, but we get to carry it into our life beyond this building and this time. Whoever God's Spirit is impressing on your heart, don't assume that person is too busy to be invited. We live in a very lonely world where people are looking for others to incorporate them into, into your life and their life. Where is selfishness shaped into service? Where is selfishness shaped into service? It's when we're with Jesus, when we're focused on his life and teachings, when we're shaped to become like Jesus and live into his abundant life of service in God's kingdom. Would you join me in prayer as we close? Father God, thank you for what you have blessed us with, the abundant life that you created us to have, that that in our um, rebellion we separated from that life and chose a different way. Father, we almost don't know how to get out of the mess that we put ourselves in by separating ourselves from you. Father, but you know how to pull us back. Father, thank you for your son Jesus who, who came to earth to take on a life like ours and the, the messiness of our life, who took on death, the thing that we could never overcome on our own, and offers us eternal abundant life with you. Father, thank you for Jesus' example of not giving in to selfishness so that he could do your will of bringing us back into your life so that he could serve us. Father, help us to be shaped into that way of life, into that abundant life that looks odd to the world around us. Like, how is that abundant life? But Father, we see the abundant life that, that your son Jesus experienced in Scripture and Father, that's the life we long for. Where we're free from anxiety and worry and in our just making things happen on our own. Help us to give that over to you and allow you to shape us into the abundant life that you have for us. Shape us from selfishness into service. Show us who we can incorporate into our life and reach out to and use the resources and abilities that you've given us to help meet the needs of your church and the people around us. Lead us and guide us as we reflect on us. It's by the power of your spirit and through your son Jesus that we pray this. Amen. Can you stand and sing with us?
You can be seated. As we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, I'd like to focus on Psalm 55. We read that David grieves because he is surrounded by enemies and one of his closest friends betrays him. But through all of this, he trusts in the Lord and states in verse 22, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. So what weighs on your mind today? What is pulling your spirit in different directions and wearing you out? Rest assured, God knows all about your troubles and concerns. No matter how strong we think we are, he understands that we are weak and can only handle so much at one time. That's why he promises to help. He will carry your burdens for you. There is no time or weight limit, and no amount of trouble is too hard for him. He is willing to help and care for your every need. But you first must give your cares over to him, then trust. I don't know about you, but I needed to place burdens on our Lord this week, and I'm glad I have him by my side. He never fails. He promised to be with us. His love and grace are poured out for anyone and everyone who believes in him. So now we take this time to partake of the bread and the cup as a reminder of what he has done for each and every one of us every day. As Jordan read in Corinthians uh, verse 11, For I receive from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As you partake of the emblems today, take the time to embrace. Embrace them. And when you take this time, place yourself in the Lord's presence at the Last Supper. Feel his presence and reflect on the words he says and how that will impact your life and actions for this week. Do you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this reminder. But most of all, Lord, thank you for your suffering and death and resurrection that gives us new life, that gives us hope. Lord, may we embrace this time May we focus on you. May we focus on the family here as we all partake together. Thank you for this time. More importantly, thank you for your son who made it all possible. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
So I hope you've been able to think about how you might apply what we've been thinking about this morning from this passage in 1 Corinthians. But beyond that, there's some other ways you could probably apply that same thing for some other things coming up in our community. One being the Kids Summer Extravaganza, where we're hoping to host a number of kids um, connected to a bunch of families in this building uh, for that week. And with programming, it engages them to encounter the abundant life that they can have in Jesus. If that's something you're able to help with, we would appreciate the help that we could get. And there's a sign-up sheet on the table as you leave these double doors you can look at to give some descriptions of ways that we're needing help for that week. If you could stop by and take a look at that and see how you might be able to contribute. Also, if you're looking to register your kids or grandkids or or friends, uh, you can do so at clarencecc.org. There's a tab there where you can register your kids for that experience. Starting this Wednesday at 8.28, yes, 8.28 in the morning, the odd time hopefully will, will stand out to you, and hopefully I'll make that clear here in a moment. In 1 Kings 8.28, this section of scripture comes from when Solomon, King Solomon in Israel was dedicating the fancy temple that the Israelites uh, constructed to, where God could meet them and they could meet God. And in the midst of that dedication, Solomon says this in 1 Kings 8, 28. Give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. Lord my God, hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. And what I'm trying to help get started is just fashioning a rhythm and time of prayer uh, where we can bring the future of this church before God or just any needs in general, whether it's needs of the church, personal needs you know about. I'm just trying to foster a time of prayer that you're invited to come join me in here on Wednesday morning to pray. I'll also try to facilitate a way where you could join online over Zoom where all you're going to do is basically just pop on there. There's no like interaction part. It's mostly just to be like, there's 10 people praying right now. And just knowing that we're praying together, that's, that's the idea. And I know a number of you have already told me I can't either be here that day or I can't for this, that, or the other reason. And that's the beauty of it. You can do it by not even being here. But the idea is that you're committing and participating in doing that. And what I'm asking you to do is fast from Tuesday evening after whatever meal you eat on Tuesday until the conclusion of prayer on Wednesday morning. So prayer and fasting for this church, and a variety of other needs. So I hope you'll join me this Wednesday as we start that. Lastly, I just want to point your attention to Mount View Christian Camp and the dates that are in the info page. And if you're planning to go to that or know others who would be interested in that, to sign up at mountviewchristiancamp.org. Would you join us as we sing one more song before we leave?